Good morning and welcome. We're in for a very interesting program uh, this morning. I'm Alice Rivlin. I'm the Leonard Schaefer Chair at uh, Brookings and uh, Director of the Engelberg Center. I say that by way of thanking two of our uh, generous uh, donors. Uh, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the first of our med talks, uh, as opposed to TED talks, uh, that uh, will focus on congestive heart failure in an era of payment reform. Now, payment reform is kind of an abstract concept, and we talk a lot about it here, uh, replacing the fee-for-service system with uh, payments that uh, will uh, incent providers uh, to uh, do uh, more cost-effective things. That sounds very economic-y and uh, abstract. But it affects uh, healthcare reform affects real patients and real doctors and real nurses. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the experience in two places, in Duke Hospital and in Colorado, uh, of implementing some payment reforms uh, with real patients. And this is a new format for Brookings. We don't do uh, this kind of uh, TED talk, med talk uh, often, so it's an experiment. Uh, but I think it's going to be an exciting morning, and I'm very pleased you're here. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Lee Satterfield, and uh, I stand here today before you equipped with a left ventricular assistant device in this vest that I'm wearing. I feel very well, and I'm waiting for a heart transplant. It is an honor to have been asked to give you remarks about my journey so far to start your meeting about congestive heart failure. Uh, in 1976, when I was a senior in high school, I was diagnosed with osteosarcoma <laughs> with uh, metastasis bilateral to my bilateral lungs. So uh, the treatment for that was amputation of my left leg as well as multiple lung surgeries. And of course, a heavy dose of chemotherapy, including one drug called adriamycin. Over the course of the next 30 years, things were uneventful. I began uh, my legal career. I got married, and my wife and I adopted two, 20, two, two, 20, two children, thank you. About uh, 2006, over 30 years later, that's when things uh, started. I began to experience shortness of breath. I took myself to a local hospital emergency room, was later admitted into the hospital, and after a series of tests, I was diagnosed with chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy. I think the adriamycin is the suspect here. That's what I've been told, and then damaged my heart. Uh, I like to tell my friends, my family, uh, my colleagues, when they ask, well, what does that mean? I say, well, just think of a car engine. And uh, most people are running on a six-cylinder. I sort of run on a four. But with some adjustments, I can pretty much cruise like the six-cylinder guys. And the adjustments, of course, is the medication. And so. Uh, I went on medication, uh, which kept the symptoms at bay for over a seven-year period. Uh, but the seven-year period wasn't uneventful. Some things, three significant medical events happened during that time. Uh, in 2008, when I became chief judge of the court that I'm on now, uh, my doctor felt it was important to uh, have implanted a defibrillator. And uh, I'll have to say what a life-saving decision that was that he made. Uh, because in 2011, the second event occurred, the defibrillator fired while I was speaking to an audience not like this, but a bunch of judges at a retirement party. It fired, uh, I would imagine, saving me from sudden cardiac arrest. And then the third incident that happened in 2011 was that I had a stroke. Um, at the time of the uh, stroke, I like to say 
that uh, I had, uh, my cholesterol was fine, I wasn't overweight, uh, and my blood pressure wasn't high. I didn't uh, drink, but occasionally. Uh, but I didn't smoke, even occasionally I didn't smoke. So that came as quite a surprise to all of us. I was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and of course put on additional medication including blood thinner. Over the course of the next year to a year and a half, um, I began to experience um, uh, loss of appetite which resulted in me losing over 40 pounds. Uh, it was not intended and began to experience pain in my lower right side. And that continued for a while. There were multiple hospitalizations, uh, one to treat the pain, obviously to try to find the source of the pain, which uh, with all the tests that were taking, you know, I think it was unspoken, but uh, we wanted to rule out Mr. Cancer from coming back. Uh, and that was ruled out. Um, but it was undetermined where the source of the pain was coming from through those hospitalizations. I saw multiple doctors, a GI doctor, pain doctor, uh, even uh, went to an acupuncturist to see if the pain could be relieved, as well as a nutritionist to see if maybe it was my diet. Uh, and that continued on uh, for a while uh, until I guess about uh, this time last year when I began to fail more in terms of my, later be termed my heart, uh, the pain was, was, was still there. And over a period of time, um, I would go in and out of the hospital and I went in the hospital uh, and it was determined that uh, my heart had began to fail from the echo that I had in the in injection fraction that uh, I had uh, was given for that and I was put on Milleron. And uh, during the course of that treatment, um, uh, the, uh, it was determined that I need more assistance than even that. And that's when it was determined that I should get an LVAD. Uh, and so I had operated on for the LVAD. Uh, the surgery went fine, as you can see, I'm here. Uh, but the post-operative recovery was pretty difficult for me because I had become very weak and, uh, and fatigue during that time. And um, the way I sort of like to explain it to, again, my friends and my colleagues, uh, is that uh, apparently my right ventricular uh, didn't want to work. Probably didn't have to work too much uh, over the years because my left was not pumping too much there. And uh, it was time to wake up and work. Uh, but because uh, it wasn't responding as well as the doctors would like, I had to be intubated for about nine days until I was able to wake up and breathe on my own. Uh, when I was able to do that, I realized two things immediately. One, that my voice that had become weaker over the last year and a half was coming back, becoming stronger again. And that the pain that I had in my right side, which I believe now from talking to the doctors was due to liver congestion, was um, pretty much gone. And it didn't matter how much I was eating, because I was eating by then, had an appetite, but I wouldn't gain weight as long as I wasn't pumping properly. And the nutrients, as I'm told, would go to your liver and back it up and not where they needed to go to get me going. And so the other thing that uh, happened when I woke up was that I had lost all of my muscle mass due to atrophy. My um, right side came back pretty quickly, and I would say is 100% now. My left side, not so quickly. And you should know that when I had the stroke, it was a right side stroke for a brain injury, which affected my left side. But I had walked out of the hospital after 10 days of having the stroke, excuse me, the stroke, with no physical or cognitive deficits, and went back to work three weeks later. I did have some weakness in my left hand. And so when I came out of the surgery for the LVAD, and uh, was starting my recovery. My left side did not respond as well. It's almost as if I had stroke-like symptoms, but I didn't have another stroke. Uh, and that was tested, obviously, and determined I didn't have another stroke. And most of my left side has come back, except for my left hand is still a problem. So about you know eight weeks in the hospital, 
about a month of uh, intense rehabilitation and one month at home, I went back to work in uh, October of last year and been working ever since as Chief Judge in Superior Court here in, in, in D.C. I want to just talk just briefly uh, about um, my family because you don't take these journeys alone. And, uh, you know, my wife, who's my hero, she has uh, been with me throughout all of this and uh, suffered through it as well. All the hospitalizations, the what I call the ICU delusions that I would have. I can remember one particular one in which I was so upset that I told her that uh, I'm going to take you out of our will. Well, we laugh at that now because my wife's an attorney and I'm a judge. <laughs> and we both know that as long as we're legally bound that way, it doesn't matter if we take you out of the will. You know, what's hers is mine and mine is hers. And so we laugh at that now, but not at the time. And I have uh, two teenagers, and my advice to anybody, if you're thinking about getting sick, don't do it when your kids are teenagers. Their adolescent brains doesn't comprehend that. They want a normal teenage experience. I think I expected a little bit more because I had been uh, battling cancer when I was their age, but they were your typical teenagers. To them, gone was the dad that liked to smile and joke and make breakfast and chauffeur them around. And in his place was an irritable, tired individual. And I learned through uh, this process that teenagers think quite differently than us. I have two stories to illustrate that, one about my daughter, both about my daughter, one relating to my doctor, who's here today, as well as the other uh, relating to a cat we had named Rika. I'll tell the doctor's story first. Uh, my doctor is Dr. Katz, who's here, and I'm glad to, to see him. He was my dad's doctor. And so um, I would tell my daughter that I am in great hands, and I was, because Dr. Katz is the top of his field, and he was your grandfather's doctor. Uh, my, my dad had heart disease, uh, had three heart attacks, and he passed on his third. So I thought that that would help reassure her that I was going to be okay. And over time, I would say it again to her, you know, my doctor's top notch, he's top of his field, he's your grandfather's doctor, until one day she responded to me, but dad, you know granddaddy's dead. And I say, well, yes, I do know that. <laughs> but uh, she didn't uh, kind of get what I was saying. I had to really explain it to her a little bit more. She didn't understand that my grandfather, my father, her grandfather, who she knew very well, had had, as I said, three heart attacks. The third one took his life. But between the second and third heart attack with 20 years of the fabulous care that my doctor and another doctor gave him, that let him with quality of life over 20 years until he passed of his third heart attack. She just equated the simple, you know, that's your doctor and he was your father's doctor and your father's did, what's going to happen to you? But it became clear to me in the second story that she thought that I was going to die. Our cat was a very old cat and frail and starting to get kind of bony and that's how I was at that time. I began to get very bony because of the weakness before that I received the LVAD. And, uh, and she felt and just came right out and asked, am I going to die like Rico did? Because that's what she saw, the cat kind of frail away and pass away. But I can say that due to the fabulous care that I have received, um, their dad is back. I continue to chauffeur, even though I never liked that part. <laughs> I cook the breakfast. I try to smile and, and joke more. Uh, but um, as you know, um, my journey is not at an end at this point because the LVAD that I have is a bridge to what will hopefully be a heart transplant. Um, but I live my life with courage, uh, strength, and hope because I'm convinced that the people in this room and those who may be listening through your talent, uh, dedication, and commitment will help me continue my life journey. And for that, I want to thank all of you and tell you how grateful I am and thank all of you for the gift you've given me today of listening. Have a great meeting. Thank you so much for that. Um, if I may, I'd like to just give another round of applause to Judge Satterfield for that remarkable story. Reminds me of a, of a patient with heart failure 
um, a high-level CEO who had refused to accept his diagnosis. He was not a failure, neither was his heart. He was going to use every tool at his disposal to tackle the disease. And in that spirit, he renamed his condition cardiac insufficiency. He is not alone. Heart failure is a chronic condition that affects 5.7 million people in the United States alone. It costs over $39 billion a year. It is one of the leading causes of readmissions to the hospital and one of the most expensive conditions in Medicare. While most patients are over the age of 65, it can strike at any age. That CEO's subtle change in wording from heart failure to cardiac insufficiency highlights a paradigm shift on how to think about the condition, both at an individual level and at a system level. In that vein, I'd like to explore some complexities of heart failure. And for each one of these, I'd like you to imagine a different musician playing their own instrument at their own tune. One, a complex disease. Heart failure is a complex disease in uh, which the body fills up with fluid. Uh, this congestion is a hallmark of the disease. Um, one of the problems in heart failure is that the heart doesn't pump enough blood to the body, but our body is designed to survive in the wild and feels and, and responds as though there was not enough blood overall. And it holds on to salt and water, filling up with fluid, which ends up in the legs and in the lungs, causing swelling and shortness of breath. In about half the cases, the underlying cause is a reduction in pump function, while in the other half, it's due to stiffness in the heart. The treatments include drugs and devices, as well as changes in diet and lifestyle, all of which are supported by varying levels of evidence. Second, complex patients. Heart failure affects patients who have many other problems. Typically, a patient with heart failure will have many diseases or comorbidities. About 40% of patients with heart failure have five or more conditions. There's also a large psychological impact of heart failure. About 20 to 40% of patients have additional di diagnoses of depression or anxiety, or both. Third, a complex system. It takes doctors, nurses, nutritionists, social workers, pharmacists, physical therapists, and many other professionals to take care of patients with heart failure. Furthermore, they work in a number of settings, ranging from the ICU to the inpatient ward to rehab centers to out outpatient clinics and to home care. Fourth, complex situations. Heart failure patients live in complicated environments with different levels of social support, financial resources, education, and so on. These factors, collectively called the social determinants of health, place a substantial role in the outcomes in heart failure, uh, such as readmissions to the hospital. All of this complexity can be overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be. In the case of the CEO, an understanding of the complexity of his disease enabled us to get him on good evidence-based therapy. An appreciation of his comorbidities enabled us to get help from a psychologist. Our familiarity with the, of the complexity of the system enabled us to coordinate his care efficiently. Understanding of his social determinants of health enabled us to get him the support he needed. It was as though the individual musicians got the same sheet of music and a conductor and formed into an orchestra. Together, they create a beautiful symphony. The challenge, like that faced by the conductor of an orchestra, is to bring it all together harmoniously. You may be wondering, how do we do this? I'd like to tell you a very personal story. My mother was diagnosed with advanced breast cancer. She would need surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. At 49, with no prior med medical conditions, she was devastated. Fortunately, we were referred to a compassionate oncologist who walked her through the different treatments. Sensing her fear, he explained that each modality was one more tool in our toolkit to beat the disease. She left his office feeling optimistic. He had given back her hope. That was over eight years ago, and thankfully, she's doing great. A paradigm shift enabled my mom to think of arduous treatments not as setbacks, but as tools for success. In much the same way, our understanding of the complexity of heart failure gives us many tools to help our patients. The most fundamental of these is hope. Good morning. Hi, my name is Zubin Epen. I'm a cardiologist at Duke University. 
It really is a pleasure to have a conversation with you today about what ideal, uh, ideal care could look like for a condition like heart failure. But why are we talking about heart failure in particular? What makes this condition an appealing window into both the problems and opportunities with modern day American medicine? Heart failure is a chronic condition punctuated by acute flares. And in this current model, those acute flares can be very expensive to treat. So we need to rethink and redesign that model in my opinion, and it's gonna take all of us, patients, providers, payers, and policymakers. So I'd like to take a few minutes to walk through what that could look like and see how we could redesign care. This is what care used to look like. Many of you may be familiar with this famous painting uh, by Sir Luke Files. Uh, painted in 1887, it portrays how medicine was delivered uh, towards the end of the Industrial Revolution. Here you can see a doctor visiting a sick child in the home of an impoverished laborer. Clearly they have limited resources. The sick child lays on a makeshift bed. There's two chairs that don't match that are pushed together. The doctor also has limited resources. You see a cup and spoon by his side and maybe a bottle of an elixir as well. But there was little that a doctor could do towards the end of the 19th century to treat a patient like this with an acute crisis. Much more than a limited physical exam and observation was seldom heard of. But in 2014, care for acute conditions looks very different. Patients are now treated in a hospital, in state-of-the-art facilities where doctors and nurses can effectively and quickly manage acute conditions. For acute conditions, a hospital is an ideal setting. Take myocardial infarction or heart attacks, for example. Every second counts. But for a chronic condition like heart failure, it is unclear whether a hospital-centric model is the most efficient or the most effective. Let's walk through how a patient with heart failure might interact with a hospital-centric model. A patient may be doing well at home until they experience the acute onset of symptoms, such as shortness of breath or swelling in their legs and abdomen. Maybe they can wait a few days to get to clinic and wait for an appointment with their regular provider. Or maybe they're so sick that they call 911 and are transported by EMS to the emergency department. Even if the patient is able to wait for a clinic appointment, then maybe the doctor says, you know, there's not much that I can probably do in this clinic and sends them to the emergency department anyway. Regardless, if the patient is sick enough, they're gonna get admitted to the hospital and then they will be there for a few days and after an expensive hospital stay, they'll return home only to repeat the cycle again soon. For Medicare beneficiaries where the leading cause of readmissions is heart failure, one in four will probably repeat this cycle within the next month. As a result, we are spending a lot. Hospitalizations is part of that, but America dominates the world when it comes to healthcare spending. Usually I liken when the US dominates something like the Olympic medal count or international basketball, but with this, I could do without being first in healthcare spending. You all well know that we spend close to a fifth of our GDP on healthcare. And it's not clear that we're getting a lot of value for a healthcare dollar either. We're not living longer. By a simple measure like life expectancy, 26 other countries do better than us. Their citizens live longer than us. So it's not clear we're getting value for a healthcare dollar. Where are we spending it? A lot of it is spent in the hospital and on clinical services. In heart failure, over $37 billion is spent every year in the United States, and over 70% of that is on inpatient care. Frequent hospitalizations are an issue for patients with heart failure. And recognizing this, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services started publicly reporting these readmission rates for hospitals in 2009. And in fiscal year 2013, we started penalizing hospitals for higher than predicted readmission rates. You know, we all thought that maybe a few hospitals would get penalized. It turned, that two, it turned out that 2,215 hospitals would be penalized. That's two out of every three hospitals. The final bill, $227 million. So there's a real case, a compelling and urgent need to redesign and rethink how we deliver care for chronic conditions like heart failure particularly because we're not getting closer to this, a triple aim that was put forth by Don Berwick and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We're not reducing the per capita cost of care, just as we discussed. We're not improving the patient experience of care. I'm sure that patients would rather be at home with their loved ones than in the hospital with me. And we're not improving the health of this population. Within a month of a heart failure hospitalization, one in 10 Medicare beneficiaries will die. Within a year, one in three will be dead. So there certainly is a way that we need to think about how we can redesign care, particularly for lower risk patients. At Duke, we have created a same day access clinic for heart failure. This is a clinic staffed by two nurse practitioners and myself 
every weekday to see patients with urgent symptoms of heart failure. Symptoms that they could not wait for a regular appointment with their provider but needed to be seen, seen on the same day. We see these patients who come from home who might otherwise not have an option except to go to the emergency department or hospital. And we can provide intravenous treatments in this clinic that allows these patients to get care that they otherwise might not receive unless they went to the emergency department or hospital. Medications like intravenous diuretics that allow them to quickly get rid of some of the fluid that's causing their symptoms. We also see patients who come from the hospital and we work very closely with our colleagues in the inpatient side to see patients after discharge. We know that hospitals who have early follow-up rates after discharge tend to have lower 30-day readmission rates. But a lot of hospitals in the health system simply don't have the capacity see, to see patients this quickly after discharge. Think about the busy community cardiologist. They may round on the inpatient uh, beds, they may perform procedures in the cath lab, and they may see clinic patients all on the same day. For those kinds of providers, it's very difficult to see patients so quickly and have enough capacity on the outpatient side to treat all these patients. With the same day access clinic, we can see patients immediately after discharge, ensure clinical stability, reconcile medications, and educate patients. Let me walk you through an example of one patient that I saw recently and tell you his story. His, his name is Mr. Robert Church, and he's a delightful 87-year-old gentleman from Bristol, Tennessee. He recently had open heart surgery to replace one of his cardiac valves and moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, which is close to Duke, to live with his son. His son is a fantastic caregiver. He also heads a local home health agency, so he knows what it takes to provide services in the home to help a patient recover after major surgery. Initially, Mr. Church did very well. He was able to work with physical therapy and occupational therapy, but soon he started to see that he was becoming more and more tired with some of those exercises. Soon he was short of breath even when walking to the bathroom, and ultimately, he was short of breath even at rest when lying in bed. Additionally, he started to see that he was starting to gain fluid in his legs and in his abdomen. His skin was tight and he was uncomfortable. His son called his local primary care provider, whose only suggestion, because he didn't think of any other options, was to go to the emergency department in Raleigh. His son knew about the same day access clinic and called Duke. And we were able to see him the same day, see him within a couple hours, give him intravenous medications, and help him lose eight pounds of fluid over the next couple of days. His symptoms resolved. I saw him back in clinic after that, adjusted his oral medications, and then returned his care back to the primary care provider without involving the emergency department or hospital. This is the kind of model where I'd love to see more hospitals and health systems use so that we can intensify outpatient disease management and help providers, particularly for the low risk patients, take care of those patients at home in the clinic without ever involving the emergency department or hospital. Certainly, there are patients that are going to require the emergency department hospital. Mr. Satterfield, for example, showed us an example of where the ED in the hospital may be very important. There are also lower risk patients where if we act preemptively and in a timely manner where access is critical, we can really provide some resources and be better stewards of those costly and acute services in the ED and hospital. Ultimately, we love if patients could also not even need the same day access clinic. Maybe they could stay at home and really optimize their care and management at home. Self-care, though, is very difficult. The typical heart failure patient may take as many as 12 medications every day. I have seasonal allergies, and so I have to take one medication, Flonase, and I forgot to take that today, which is probably why I sound a little nasal. Uh, but you know, if one medication is something I can forget, just imagine taking 12 medications every day. Very difficult. In addition to that, patients must be able to adhere to strict diet and lifestyle recommendations. They need to limit their salt and fluid intake. And for patients who are elderly, who have limited capacity to cook, for financially strapped patients who might eat a lot of canned and preserved foods, it can be very difficult to do something this simple. They must be able to manage other conditions. Heart failure loves company. No patient has just heart failure, and they often have other conditions that also need to be managed actively, such as atrial fibrillation and diabetes. And even if you take all those other conditions out, just managing the heart failure alone can be difficult because you have to be vigilant and you have to actively monitor for symptoms and understand when to act before it gets too late. This is a complex process, and the decision-making that goes along with this is not something that's very easy. A patient must understand early the symptoms that they are having, recognize that it's part of their condition, evaluate those symptoms, and decide to take action. 
And when they do, they need to make sure that they implement the correct treatment strategy and evaluate the response to that therapy. For patients particularly with low health literacy, this is a difficult. And those are the patients that are often the ones that will come back to the hospital. And this is what a patient goes to the doctor for anyway, right? They ask a doctor to help them with this process, to evaluate their symptoms, to help treat them with the correct treatment strategy, and then evaluate the response to therapy. I think we can help patients do this at home, and part of this is going to be by improving the technologies that we can use to remotely monitor patients. If we can remotely monitor their symptoms, understand when patients are decompensating or getting worse, and act in real time and connect with those patients at home, we might be able to better manage their conditions at home. Today, remote monitoring technologies have not been shown in randomized studies to reduce mortality or rehospitalizations. But a lot of the technologies that have been studied to date really require active participation on the, on the behalf of the patient. They require data entry, active engagement. If we can develop technologies, including sensors, to passively monitor these patients, we might have a way to monitor them in real time while not being in the home and then connect with them when we need to to help treat them. And ultimately, we may be able to get back to this where if we have those remote monitoring capabilities, we can understand when the patient is doing worse and even visit the patient at home to treat them before they get so sick that they need the clinic, much less the, the emergency department or hospital. If we're able to do this and really decentralize care and move care for lower risk patients into lower fixed cost settings, I think we can do a better job of managing the overall health of this population. We can reduce the per capita cost of care, we can improve the patient experience, and we can improve the overall health of this population. If we do that, we'll get closer to that triple aim. I think we'll get closer to what patients want and also what providers, payers, and policymakers need. And this is the way I think that we can improve care to involve more settings, including things like the same to access clinic and interventions at home. And this is, hope, this is what I hope I can see ideal care evolving to in the near future. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Mai Pham, and I'm a general internist. I work at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, and uh, it's a real privilege to be with you today. Um, I do, however, have the responsibility of being the party pooper. So we heard from Judge Satterfield um, earlier this morning about his really remarkably positive experience, as difficult as it was clinically and personally. He had, obviously, an incredibly talented clinical team and a lot of very good luck getting some very sophisticated care. And we just heard from Zubin about his vision of the new world of care delivery for congestive heart failure, where there may be more efficient technologies and lower cost care settings where we can take care of these patients. That's great. I also share those visions. But I'm haunted by what I know to be the current reality for much more the larger proportion of patients. Um, my brother is a pulmonologist in private practice in suburban Pennsylvania. It's an area that used to be coal country. So he has a lot of congestive heart failure patients. And on any given day, I guarantee you that he has a CHF patient walking into an emergency room, maybe in that community, maybe in a neighboring community or Philadelphia. And the reality is that ED team may not even know he has a cardiologist or a pulmonologist. They may not even know who his primary care physician is. They may know one of his many physicians. They may call one of his many physicians. But if they don't know who's really coordinating his care, the right phone calls won't actually get made at the right times. And if they don't make the right phone calls, guess what? They don't know all of his history. They don't know all of, all of the tests that he's already been through or the medications he's already been on, the dosages he's supposed to have. Remember, this is a patient having an acute clinical episode, maybe not the clearest thinker in the room. And if they don't know those things, as a consequence, we can probably guess that that hospitalization may be longer than is necessary, may involve more tests than the patient actually needs. And then when the hospital's ready to discharge him home, they might have the wherewithal to order an oxygen tank if that's what the patient needs. And they may politely say, as I recall politely saying to patients discharging from the ED, please remember to call your primary care physician and arrange for a follow-up visit as soon as possible. That's terrific. 
So now you've got someone who just went through a serious acute clinical episode, who didn't see their regular physicians in the hospital, being sent home with new equipment, and in order to have the wherewithal to please call your primary care physician and arrange for a follow-up. And by the way, transport yourself there with the oxygen tank. That's the reality for too many patients. And it doesn't matter that their clinicians are talented, well-intended, and trying to do the right thing. Now, one of the major reasons why it doesn't matter is that the current way that we pay for medical care in this country gets in the way. In the current fee-for-service system, what we pay for are the number of services. We pay for volume. We don't actually pay, in most instances, for the value of that care, how good the quality is, how good the patient experience is. And when that happens, there isn't really a business case for clinicians to do the right thing as often as they might or as well as they might. Moreover, the way that we pay for things is grossly inaccurate. We overpay for some things and underpay for other things. And unfortunately, the things that we tend to underpay for are those things where the clinician is actually doing the thought work, talking to the patient, educating them, learning what the hurdles are at home, thinking about the problems, coming up with the solutions. Those are things that we underpay or don't pay for at all. So as a consequence, patients aren't getting what they need, and clinicians have a much harder time doing what they want to do for their patients. If left alone, I guarantee you that this scenario is not going to get better. In fact, it will get worse. Why? Because the fiscal pressures, as I'm sure Alice will reinforce, the fiscal pressures on Medicare and private employers, anybody who's paying for health care in this country, are not going to get better. We are all going to have to confront more patients, older patients, sicker patients, who all want and expect care that is patient-centered and high quality. If left alone, the business case for clinicians to do the right thing is only going to deteriorate over time. And I would argue that that is a long-term inexorable trend that we, none of us, can afford to ignore. What it does do, however, is to offer tremendous opportunity. And so I want to talk you through several of those where the a couple of themes are important to keep in mind. One is that we have to assume that no one size in the way that we've reformed the way we pay for services is going to fit all situations. That said, the major overall theme is that if you believe that clinicians, when they are told they are accountable for the outcomes of care, for the quality, for the patient experience, for the spending and whether that spending makes sense. If you tell them that, suddenly all of their incentives are aligned to do the right thing. And the business case starts to make sense and look like it might have legs for the long term. So I want to talk through three scenarios, three on-ramps, if you will, for clinicians to consider to get on this road to a better future and payment reform. The first is uh, something called bundled payments or episode-based payments, and it's really targeted at clusters of clinicians and facilities. And in this option, that entity, let's say a hospital, decides that they are going to walk into a deal where the insurer, for example, Medicare, will judge them based on the outcomes, the costs, the quality, the patient experience for a given episode of care, where that episode is anchored at the beginning, maybe by an event, like that hospitalization. And at the end, maybe by another marker, say 30 days after the patient goes home. Everything that happens in between those two markers, that hospital is accountable for. Well, now you go back to my brother's patient. Suddenly, that ED, wherever it is, they have a much stronger incentive to ask the patients and the family do everything they can to figure out who their primary physician is, to make the right phone call, to get the right information, to make sure that the tests they order are only the appropriate ones, reconcile the medication dosages, send the patient home with the right equipment. Oh, and by the way, 
with that follow-up appointment already made and in hand for the patient. Okay. This works really well if you've got clusters of clinicians and facilities that are close to one another, know one another, and if you can reasonably predict what the cost for that type of episode should be. The second scenario is targeted at something I think of as an advanced primary care practice, and that you'll sometimes hear other people refer to as medical homes. And this is a scenario where a practice, a primary care practice, may get a monthly fee. They call them care management fees. And maybe also they're offered the opportunity to share a, a portion of any of the savings that they generate. But essentially what happens is they get this monthly fee for each of their patients and they pivot and invest it. Because this is a model where it's not just payment reform, it's also an explicit redesign of the care delivery approach. What do they invest it in? They invest it in time to free up their physicians from that hamster wheel of billing for services so that they can think through better processes within the practice. They invest it in hiring new staff and training them, maybe to educate patients, to track who the highest risk patients are, to educate them. And they invest it in the time that they spend with their patients. Um, and so then if you have this patient walk into the ED, that woman, with even in the middle of her acute episode, has been well trained by the nurse care manager within her primary care practice to tell the ED, please call this practice. And when they call that practice, as part of the explicit redesign of care delivery, just as Zubin's clinic um, had done, they will have 24-7 access to her clinical records. That means they can give the ED all the information that they need on the patient. Not only that, they can work with the hospital physicians during her stay to make that stay more efficient and more comfortable and effective for her. And then when she's ready to go home, not only is there an oxygen tank, there's a pill box filled out with all the medication dosages she's going to need for the eight days until her follow-up visit, which, by the way, is already scheduled, with a car service ready to pick her up at the right time and drop her off. And then some extra time spent by the care coordinators in the practice educating her family and her caregivers about what danger signs to look for so that they know to call the practice if something goes wrong before the follow-up visit. That's a vision, right? And then the third option is probably the most complex one. And it's really targeted at large groups of clinicians and facilities, what we call accountable care organizations. And as a group, they decide that they're going to take on joint responsibility for those cost, quality, patient experience outcomes for an entire population of patients, usually a very large population. The insurer might give them some care management fees. More often than not, that ACO may invest its own funds. It invests it in very much similar architecture and infrastructure as the advanced primary care practice did but sort of amped up. So an ACO theoretically can do even more care management than advanced primary care practice because they'll have more ability to do sophisticated data analysis. They can have more staff and more diversified staff. So not one nurse care manager trying to do all those touches with the patient, but maybe someone who really specializes in dietary education, maybe someone who really specializes in rehab and exercise. Maybe someone who really specializes in how to talk with caregivers and dealing with end-of-life issues. And that ACO um, ideally could get very creative. We have seen ACOs develop smartphone apps for patients to use to find the nearest open urgent care center on the weekend or after hours so they don't have to end up in the emergency department. We know of one ACO that gave all of the EDs in their area a photo book, photographs, portraits of each one of their physicians, so that if a patient of theirs shows up and can't remember the name of the doctor because, you know, they're short of breath in an acute clinical episode, the ED can take out this book and they can flip through the mug shots and point to the person they think is most relevant to their care. 
This is what payment reform can do. It can free clinicians up to take the initiative, to really spend the time and the energy that it takes to understand where their patients are coming from and then meet them right there to improve care. So should you do this if you're a doc? I have to say it's not a straightforward question because this is really, really scary stuff. It is hard to overstate how difficult this work is. It is difficult to convince your partners to go along and try something that is so unfamiliar for which there is no guaranteed return. That's going to take time and energy away from the things you know how to do. It is hard to do the financial analysis even to figure out if this is a deal you want to take because you and I know that there are many practices in this country that don't actually do formal budgeting each year. It is hard to understand the complex rules involved in each of these programs and to comply with them. And then, after all that, you have to pivot and try to explain to your patients what you're doing, why you're doing it, why you think it's good for them, and get them engaged. That is really hard stuff. But you know what? It's very clear that to not try it should be scarier. You should be terrified of not trying it. It is precisely because this work is so difficult that you have to get started now, because change takes time. And if you don't start now, when that harsh reality of the new payment future comes, you will not be ready. And you will not have a business case to do the right thing. So from my perspective, and from what I've observed of the many clinicians and organizations that have tried to do this, the reasons for looking back are grossly outweighed by the reasons to move forward. Thanks. My name is George Cheely. I'm a hospitalist physician at Duke University, and I'm the medical director for Care Redesign for Duke University Health System. Now, indulge me for a moment, and I'll ask you all to think about three of your strengths. All right, start thinking a little bit. When you have those strengths in mind, let me see you raise your hands. Hands are creeping up, brows are furrowed, light bulbs are starting to turn on. Three strengths. Hands are gradually climbing higher. I think we all in this room, we all have strengths. Now indulge me for a minute longer and think about why those are your strengths. How did they come to be that way? Why is it that when someone sees you, they say, you're great at that? I think for most of us, that's a little bit of natural talent. But for most of us, that's a lot of hard work. That's a lot of focus on what we do and how we do it and how we can do it better. That's a focus on improvement. At Duke, heart failure is one of our strengths. We've been focused on trying to get better for a long time. In the late 90s and early 2000s, we put together a plan to try and help patients manage their disease. That evolved into tools to try and help providers in the hospital make sure their patients were getting the right tests and the right treatments at the right time. And now we're making phone calls to patients after they leave the hospital to review their medications, to review their changes, to make sure they have that follow-up appointment that Zubin mentioned, maybe even with Zubin. But we have to push ourselves to get better. We have to improve. Why is this so urgent? It's, it's not urgent for us as an institution. It's urgent because healthcare's local. We owe it to our patients. 
We took care of more than 1,500 patients in our three hospitals last year. Most of those patients live in the Triangle area. That's Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. In Durham County, we've cared for almost every resident at one point in time or another. So what's it like to take care of heart failure in Durham? Well, we need to be ready to teach the next person who comes into our clinic how to take care of their disease, and that person might be anyone. It might be an emeritus professor at one of our universities. It might be a mother of three who left high school a little early because she had to support her family. Or it might be a strawberry farmer who used to grow tobacco. Life in Durham is not easy for everyone. Not everyone lives close to a clinic. Not everyone can get to a grocery store. And you can imagine that if you're walking across the living room and getting short of breath and walking to the bus stop, getting on the bus, picking out a head of lettuce, that's a tall task indeed. Healthcare is local. Healthcare payment is local as well. In Durham, we and our neighboring hospitals and clinics, we haven't seen many of the changes that are taking hold in other places around the country. But we know that payment reform is coming. And we see it as a strong signal that we need to keep improving. We need to try harder. We need to move faster. And we need to do that because we need to start learning. A small part of that learning involves understanding the finances of what different models will mean. A big part of that learning involves understanding how we can take great care of patients in those new models. You heard from Zubin about our commitment to heart failure as a chronic disease. We're committed to helping our patients manage their diseases. We're committed to helping our population in Durham County take care of itself. Part of that commitment involves understanding what changes we need to make as an organization to help patients succeed. Heart failure is complicated. If patients have a flare-up, they might need an extra dose of medicine at home. Or they might need to come to the hospital and to be on life support for a while. Those complexities are part of taking care of our populations of patients. And Zubin shared with you all his vision for a newer model, a model where we can catch things a little bit earlier, where we can focus on helping patients stay well. And that's a little bit of a new concept, at least compared to the fee-for-service world that we've heard about earlier. To help patients stay well, we need to focus on helping patients understand their disease. We need to help patients take medicines when they need to at home, to get help at home. And we need to have our, our clinic appointments available when patients need them. And if patients need to come into the hospital, then we need to help them come into the hospital and, and make that transition back home as seamlessly as possible. But we need to be able to do that if the patient's been admitted five days ago, 15 days ago, or if the patient's never been admitted to the hospital in their life. If we can succeed in helping patients stay well, then our patients come out better off. In a shared savings model, the people who are providing care for those patients also might come out a little bit better off. And the people who are paying for care for those patients might come out a little bit better off. But we as an organization, we need to keep doing better. And doing better, improving, involves making changes, changes for the better. And those changes aren't easy. For changes to be successful, we need to build on our strengths. At a time when resources are scarce, changes need to be focused 
on areas where we can have impact. And for changes to be lasting, goodness knows they need to be lasting, we need to stay true to our values. Chief among those values is taking great care of patients. And so how do we as an organization begin to make those changes? Well, like so many other places, we rely on our people to set the vision and to put that vision in motion to make changes happen. You met one of those great people just a few minutes ago. Zubin was on stage speaking about his hard work. I need to introduce you to a few other of those people. The first, the first is named John Anderson. Oh, that's you know, not, a, not a flashy name. John is a primary care doctor in Oxford, North Carolina. John has a smile that's catching. He's got a, a, a healthy southern accent, if you can imagine what I mean. And John has a shock of white hair that he'll swear to you used to cover his whole head at one point in time. John likes wearing broken in black cowboy boots and John loves teaching providers how to make their clinics safer. John also loves borrowing a quote. And that quote John says is, hope is never a good plan. John's also the chief medical officer for Duke Primary Care. What is John's plan? John's plan is to stay true to his patients. He's working with his providers to identify ways they can be more efficient, whether that's through technology or through doing what they do better. He's doing that so that patients can have appointments available when they need them. John's working with the nurses in his clinics and the clinic staff to improve coordination, to improve communication, to make clinics feel a little bit more like a medical home. And John's working with his administrative team to look squarely at Durham to understand where patients have easy access to clinics and where patients have a hard time accessing clinic so that he can understand how we as an organization can support those patients who can't make it in quite so easily. The next person I need to introduce you to is one of the nurse practitioners that Zubin mentioned in the same day access heart failure clinic. That person is Midge. Midge Bowers is a little different from John. She she has a full head of hair. Her hair is curling and brown, and she talks a little faster than John. You know when Midge talks her fastest? She talks her fastest when she's excited. And when does she get excited? Well, she gets excited talking about her patients. She loves to tell a story about a patient who she's known for a long time. That patient has talked for a long time about a special day in their life. We've all had a special day in our lives that we've been looking forward to. Midge knew when that day was coming and she knew five days beforehand when she got a call from that patient that, Midge, I'm in trouble. I need some help. She had to get that patient into clinic. That patient came in the same day. That patient got treated day over day. That patient was able to avoid spending more time in the hospital than they needed to. They didn't have to go to the hospital. They were able to make it to that special day. Mitch has a lot of experience taking care of heart failure. She's been doing it for 15 years. And for her, the same day access clinic represents a way to get the right care for the right patients at the right time in the right place. Now the last person I'm gonna introduce you to is a little bit different. Her name is Mary Duke Biddle Trent Siemens. That's a mouthful. She's the granddaughter of James B. Duke, and she's one of the people who has helped the Duke family transform their legacy from one of tobacco to one of philanthropy and one of community activism in Durham. Mary was an alumna of Duke University and a very strong supporter of medical education. Mary's picture crops up around campus, and let me help you try and see Mary a little bit. She's a, a matronly sort of grandmotherly figure, and she's got flowing gray hair. Her face is graced with a few wrinkles. Those wrinkles, I think, are mostly from smiles, but they're from a few stern glances as well. Mary reminds us 
that we have to keep improving and we have to do it faster. We have to do it for our patients in Durham. We also have to do it because we have a responsibility to train providers. Responsibility to train the next generation who will be changing how we do what we do. Well, I thank you all for indulging me at the beginning. I'm going to ask you to indulge me again here as we wrap up. And I'm going to step up on a, on a, on a fairly strong box of soap. And I'm going to address you in a little bit of a way as an administrator, but mostly as a physician. I'm a physician at an organization that pushes us to improve, an organization with strong physician leaders. And I'll say that we as healthcare provider institutions, we need our senior leaders to partner closely with our physicians. And we need them to work with our payers and with our patients. We need to sit at the same table. We need to drink the same water. We need to do that because we need a shared vision for change. That vision needs to build on our strengths and that vision must rely on our values. And I'll say that as we're talking about payment reform, which we have to be talking about, as we're talking about ways to be more efficient, to reduce waste from the system, we cannot lose sight of our common ground. We cannot lose sight of our focus on change. We cannot lose sight of taking great care of patients. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Allen. I'm a heart failure doctor at the University of Colorado. Um, as it turns out, I was actually at Duke uh, before my current job. And in 2008, I moved to Denver, uh, where I grew up. Um, at the time that I moved to uh, Colorado, it, as it turns out, the care of heart failure patients who would come into the hospital was relatively similar between these two institutions. Patients would come into the emergency department short of breath. We would be called as heart failure doctors to admit these patients. We would rapidly diagnose their problems, try and treat any reversible causes or uh, exacerbating factors that they might have. And then in the hospital, we would give them intravenous diuretics to remove fluid to improve their congestion. Usually on around day five, uh, these patients would feel better and look better. And so we would rapidly scramble at that point in time among the medical team to send these patients out the door. Um, so under this system, um, you may say, well, what else was going on? And uh, I would say that this, this story I just uh, told you about a hospital admission is actually pretty typical for patients with heart failure. 70% um, of people who come into the hospital really only receive intravenous diuretics as their new, as their new therapy or what's done for them. Um, and under the, the DRG episode of care payment system, our incentive is really to stabilize those patients um, and get them out of the hospital as fast as possible. For that initial admission, our hospital would get paid about $9,000 to stabilize the patient and get them out again. And if they were to come back to us and get readmitted, we would get another $9,000 to restabilize those patients and get them out the door again. Now, you may say um, that that seems a little uncaring, that it's short-sighted, that we're not really focused on the patient. Um, and I would say that that's what we're paid to do. The, the old system really tells us that, um, that when patients come in for an acute exacerbation, our job is to, to fix that exacerbation and get them out again. Um, and, and, uh, and so that's really what, what has been done traditionally. Um, you all also may say, well, in, in terms of that being short-sighted, um, that we don't care about our patients. And what I would argue is that the care of these patients is very complex. There are uh, so many things that can be done for these patients in hospital. Um, and so we tend to focus on the ones that we're paid to do. So if you, want patient, if you want physicians and hospital systems to do things differently, you have to pay us differently. 
So there's been a real cultural shift over the last six years at the University of Colorado, and I think you've heard already some of that shift happening elsewhere in the United States. And this shift was largely pushed forward by the health policy and reimbursement changes that have been happening. So um, instead of having a DRG payment system, um, we've had some incentives that have made us think about this differently. One of the, f the, the real important changes is this focus on outcomes that you've heard about. So starting in 2009, the uh, Medicare started reporting risk standardized readmission rates for heart failure for all the hospitals in the United States that receive uh, payments for caring for those patients. And then starting in, with our care in 2012, those rates have been tied to reimbursement um, uh, and penalties as you also heard about. So this caught a lot of attention at our hospital. These kind of changes both in terms of how we're perceived among our community and among our peers, as well as the penalties and payments that we receive really uh, garnered our attention. The problem is, is that um, University of Colorado is like 80% of healthcare in the United States in the sense that it's fee-for-service based. And so the structure of the healthcare system is largely around individual services. And for the University of Colorado, what we do is we provide acute in-hospital care, as most of what we do, when patients have an exacerbation. So if you change from this DRG payment system to one that says now we have to be responsible for the patient for the next 30 days, that's a huge challenge to us. In our system, which is not unlike a lot of others, two-thirds of our patients receive their primary care and other ambulatory care separate from our system through either individual um, uh, private practice providers or other health systems in the Denver area. So once our patients leave the door, we don't really have what I would say is direct control over those patients' care. Additionally, many of the, the services that we might provide following discharge, like home health or skilled nursing facilities, are also largely separate from our system. So again, once those patients leave the door, they're a little bit out of our control. Many hospitals have complained about this. Um, people have certainly had frustration. They've asked the policies to be changed back. But I feel very fortunate to be part of an institution where I think people saw this challenge as an opportunity, as a way to rethink the way that we take care of patients and to really do a better job um, uh, at providing the care that, that we strive to, uh, to provide. So in order to change our focus and allow us to rethink and redo uh, the way that we take care of our heart failure patients, particularly after they leave the hospital, we had to put together a new structure that allowed us to do that better. Um, so initially, we, um, we had different aspects of the hospital come together to rethink the way that they approached this. The first was through our administration. So our administration um, applied for the uh, Medicare uh, bundle payment program under Model 4, which essentially what we did is voluntarily said, instead of you giving us that $9,000 payment every time somebody comes in the hospital, we'd rather that you give us $13,000 for the next 30 days of care, inpatient care for that patient. Many people ask me, why would your hospital do this? And I've actually asked our administration why they did it, because it wasn't me telling our administration to do it. It was actually independent that our administration signed up for this bundle. And the answer that I get from them is, this is the way healthcare is moving. Healthcare can no longer be a fee-for-service structure, or we get the kind of problems that we've been talking about. Our administration and our financing department says that this is going to happen, and so we better learn how to do it. And so they voluntarily joined um, the, the, the bundle pilot program because um, they felt that this was a contained but real way for us to experiment with this, to create financial incentives that allow us to explore different ways that we can change clinical care. So it's great to have that kind of partnership as a clinician. The second thing we did is convene a multidisciplinary committee of people who provide care in our healthcare system for patients with heart failure. So I think a lot of organizations would think, well, let's get together the advanced heart failure doctors like me and come up with a good plan for this. And fortunately, I work with other people who understand that teamwork and diversity of experience is critical. 
And so instead of doing that, bringing a couple of doctors together, what we did is convened a panel of people that d provide care in all kinds of different ways. So this is not just physicians or not even just nurses um, on the inpatient side and not even just nurses on the outpatient side, but we brought together pharmacists, social workers, other care coordinators, our volunteer department uh, at the hospital. We invited in people from home health agencies and, and skilled nursing facilities that aren't even part of our healthcare system, and even some of our competitors across town at Kaiser to come in and work together to rethink this um, uh, and how we're gonna provide care for our patients. The other is that the, the, the key to being part of this committee was not so much what you do um, but having a real passion for thinking about healthcare and how we could do better for our heart failure patients. And then finally, after some needs assessment, we realized that we had to rely somewhat on information technology as a platform for improving our care. So while the care of complex heart failure patients requires people really taking care of people, we had to have some kind of automated system for efficiently um, identifying patients, organizing the things we wanted to do, and triggering those things to happen. I don't know much about information technology, um, and I will tell you that in addition to the challenge of thinking about longitudinal care at an organization like ours that's primarily inpatient care, another huge challenge has been our shift over to an electronic health record. We um, went from mostly paper records over to the EPIC electronic health record in 2010, and this brought a lot of changes and a lot of additional complaints from some people. But I think we also saw it as another opportunity and a synergistic um, opportunity to go with our care reform. So with those three kind of key structural pieces in place, we were then able to move forward with what I'll describe as three key components to redesigning our healthcare. The first was to use this committee and the information technology through our EPIC electronic medical record to identify patients. So it may come as a surprise to some of you, but when patients are admitted to the hospital, the nurse and the doctor may know that that patient has heart failure, but largely our hospital doesn't know who in the hospital has heart failure. And there are reasons for this. The first is that most admission diagnoses when people first come in have to do with shortness of breath and edema and other symptoms that the patient may be having, and therefore they're not very helpful. The second is that heart failure is a condition that affects a large number of people under, uh, that, that tend to go to a variety of services. So our heart failure patients are all over the hospital. They're not concentrated on some specific service. The, the last is that when we talk about grading ourselves on how we're doing or Medicare applies penalties to how we're doing with heart failure, that's based on the primary discharge diagnosis that patients get. And as you can imagine, a discharge diagnosis can't be applied until the patient is discharged and has left the hospital. And for our hospital, 80% um, of patients receive that primary discharge diagnosis um, on about day four after discharge, after the patient's gone home. So, under the prior system, we're talking about trying to deliver better care to patients with heart failure and do better on what happens to those patients after. And we don't even know who those patients are until they're gone. So the very first thing that we did was use our electronic medical record to come up with a way to automatically identify patients in the hospital who had heart failure in real time. So we had to work with clinicians who had some experience about how does this work in the hospital? What are the things that signify a patient who probably does have heart failure and is being treated primarily for that? And with our information technology system to pull data elements that made sense with that. And then a lot of my experience and research has actually been constructing risk models. And so through iteration, multiple iterations, we're actually able to use our record now so that as patients come in the hospital and data is entered into the electronic medical record as part of their clinical care, we now extract that data and use it to decide whether a patient is probably going to have heart failure or not. Our final algorithm is actually a, a diagnosis of heart failure, which is actually rarely given, intravenous diuretics, which are used for other things but mostly for heart failure, and, or a BNP, or a, a, a lab test, 
that would signify that a patient has heart, may have heart failure. That algorithm in a month in our hospital institution identifies 150 patients out of the 2,500 that we care for. 50 of those patients will have heart failure, and this algorithm identifies about 48 out of the 50. So it's very good at telling us who is going to have heart failure. It also identifies another 100 patients who actually don't end up with a primary discharge diagnosis of heart failure. So you may think that's a problem, but actually the majority of those end up with a secondary diagnosis of heart failure. So essentially now in our hospital, in a month, we get essentially all the patients who end up with heart failure, and then I would also identify some of those who actually have it as an important problem. The second thing we did then is now that we know who has heart failure in our hospital at the time of admission, and actually this algorithm tends to work um, within an hour or two of diagnosis, we can then provide optimal basic care to everybody. And the way that we do this is we use the identification algorithm to trigger standardized order sets for these patients. So these are order sets that physicians enter on patients when they're admitted and then through the course of their hospitalization that we design to specifically deal with the problems that are unique to heart failure. Um, and we spend a lot of time through our committee identifying what those things are. So we definitely take care of those Medicare quality improvement um, metrics that talk about the process of care. But we also feel that education is critical for these patients. And so now, instead of trying to provide education an hour prior to discharge when the patient is frantically trying to get out the door, we can actually start that now on day one. We have educational materials that we've developed that now we give patients when they come in the hospital. So the nurses and their family and even the patient when they have time in the hospital can actually read about it in the setting where they feel sick, they know they have a problem, and they're hopefully more engaged in that. Um, this has also been a challenge. So even though we're triggering these standardized order sets on 48 out of 50 patients who ultimately get a discharge diagnosis of heart failure, Initially, our use rate was 20%. So physicians were saying, I don't want to use this. And you would say, well, why? Well, because physicians get used to doing what they want to do, and it's efficient for them. And I don't think it's because they don't want to. It's because it's, it's difficult to adopt something new. So initially, we tried to educate people about this generally. And that, that didn't work particularly well for us either. So we actually had to go to a tailored, specified education program which essentially involved us giving people specific feedback. When they had a patient with heart failure, they declined to use the order set. We went to them and talked to them and tried not to discipline them, but rather to say, hey, this is what we need to do. This is a specific example of where we missed an opportunity and we want you to do a better job in the future because we're all part of this team. And that has worked incredibly well. We're now up to 85% use of these standardized order sets. The last thing we've done is um, to try and risk stratify patients. So although our, all heart failure patients who come in the hospital are relatively high risk and they all feel pretty sick generally, um, we felt like some people are at higher risk for coming back, some people have bigger problems, and they may require more intensive interventions. The other piece of this is that if you go around and ask people, how do you prevent readmissions? Uh, some people have provided some options, but we don't really know how to do that yet. And I think the solutions are, some of the solutions at least, are specific to each institution. So what we've done is we've used the work of UT Southwestern, who also has an epic electronic medical record. Um, they created a risk score for 30-day readmission for heart failure. And we took that and put it into our epic system. And now that we know who has heart failure when they're admitted, we can take data and automatically calculate a risk score and stratify our patients every day on what we think their risk is. What we then do is pick off the top few people who seem to be the highest risk. And then what we do is we've now been piloting and trying a number of more high intensity interventions. So um, some examples of this are, the first was that we had a pharmacist meet with, with these few patients early in the hospitalization to review their medications and talk about education um, so that we're not reconciling medications at, again in the hour prior to discharge. The second thing we did is we have case management see our patients to assess what should happen to them at the time of discharge, but again, those case managers are overloaded. 
Um, and so what we do now is we pick off a few of those patients who are highest risk, have a social worker see them early in the hospitalization, and start talking about the post-discharge environment because we know that the post-discharge environment and social instability are critical to readmission and that just treating people's fluid status is not the solution to heart failure because uh, only 40% of the readmissions are even due to heart failure. The next thing we did is that we actually partnered with home health agencies um, to take a few of these patients every week and have them visited within 48 hours um, of their going home. And this is critical because we talk about having seven day follow up, but a lot of times people go home, the first day they're happy to be there, the second day they start to realize what they don't know and the problems they're having, and that's where an intervention can be critical at helping them. We look back at our data, and 40% of our readmissions in 30 days actually happen within a week. And a lot of the talk that people um, say about trying to improve readmissions is have somebody followed up in clinic within seven days. Well, there's a huge missed opportunity. So this allows us to do that. And um, so today, I think things are different than they were in 2008 when I left Duke and moved to Colorado. At Colorado now, when I'm on service, which I was just two weeks ago, when patients come to the emergency department short of breath, it's a little different. Um, I, when I open the electronic medical record on this patient, I get a flag that says, this patient probably has heart failure. Is that correct? And I say, yeah, I think they do. And then it prompts me to use a standardized order set that talks about um, all the kinds of things that are really important to start early in the hospitalization for this patient. Our administration has also entered into financial reforms that help incentivize and allow us to experiment with some of these high risk, or sorry, high intensity interventions for high risk individuals. And so I will say that I think we are doing a better job and this is a, a more fun place to work um, and our patients are doing better because of these, these changes. So if, uh, if you were wanting to uh, embark on this yourself, I think a few key ingredients from our experience. The first is that I think you have to have a desire to learn. Things are changing um, and you can either react to it or you can be proactive and say, hey, this is, this is gonna take some education and some experimentation and so we've gotta be ahead of the curve on that. And, Clearly, our administration and many of our clinical champions had that mindset of being ahead of the curve. The second is collaboration is critical. IT, administration, finance, clinicians, inpatient, outpatient, all these people have to come together and that doesn't naturally happen in the current system. You have to make it happen. The third is that there is a real diversity of thought and experience out there, and only by bringing people together in collaboration can that come together to create the synergies that are necessary. Um, I think people have to be willing to take risks. You know, our participation in the CMMI bundled payment probably is not going to make us a lot of money, at least in the short term. But the lessons that we're learning and the small contained risks that we're taking as part of the bundle, I think will pay huge dividends, not only to our institution, but to us as clinicians enjoying what we do and, and really delivering the kind of care that I think we went into medicine to deliver and ultimately will be better for our patients. Um, you have to have a system of trial and error. It's not like there's you're gonna to listen to this conference and, and look up a paper that's gonna tell you how to do this and what all the solutions are. The solutions are not clear yet and they're individualized for individual patients but also for individual institutions. And you, you've gotta learn for yourself what's gonna work. And then finally, um, leveraging technology and electronic medical record is important um, and has really helped us. But in the end, this really is about people helping people. Thank you for letting me share our experience at Colorado. I'm gonna take a minute and uh, try and come back to the stories that started us on this journey today. Um, and we heard from, doc, um, from, from Judd Satterfield. Um, and I think it's important to point out and take a minute to think about what it's like again to be a patient with heart failure. You wake up, you're short of breath. You may have to have heart surgery. You have a device implanted in your chest. You might even have a device called an LVAD, which is actually a pump that's attached to a battery that's on your, your, your abdomen at all times. Now, these are difficult times because you have to also remember to take all those medications. It's an extremely complex uh, labor to be sick with a chronic condition. 
In addition to that, think about the ecology of care that's around you. You have internists, cardiologists, you may have uh, hospice workers that are involved. You go to emergency departments, you go to the hospitals, you go to intensive care units, and not only do you have this huge number of people involved in your care, they're all paid separately. Each of them sends a bill in separately, gets paid separately. In fact, the less they cooperate, the better, because they all can keep billing and get paid more. As a result, for patients that have chronic illnesses that are at the mercy of the healthcare system, they're often the ones that the system works against most effectively because of the way the incentives are set up. And this is one of the major themes of our conversation today. How do we get the system, the people within the system, to do the right thing? Now, let's keep in mind that this system is extremely complicated. As a result, it's very difficult to imagine scrapping the whole thing and starting all over again. Some people may argue that, yes, it should be a Darwinian process of natural selection. We should create serious scarcity. In that scarcity, the fittest system should compete, and only the strong should survive. However, this concept of the thinning of the herd carries an unacceptable cost to real people. Yes, we could make those radical changes up front, but how do we feel about the effects that would have if it was our loved ones that were at the mercy of the system? Would we be the ones who'd be willing to experiment with our own loved ones with these radical changes? The answer is no. As a result, the changes you've heard about today, and in fact, many of the changes that we even would talk about are necessarily piecemeal. They will occur slowly. However, it is important to make these changes in a deliberate manner. They could be seen as conservative, but we believe, and I think we as physicians working in the system generally believe, that we have to move slowly. We have to move deliberately because we are cradling people's lives in our hands as we change. So if we take this complex system, how should we address it? And so we've heard about two different approaches, and both of them have focused on, to be honest, small sections of this larger picture. We're going to start the University of Colorado. They had an eminently reasonable way of approaching this. They, they said, let's start with the hospitals. That makes a lot of sense. The sickest patients end up in the hospital. These are the ones that need the highest intensity care. It makes sense then to say, well, look, not only that, they're geographically within a place that we can control fairly intensively. And so that's where we want to make a difference. Now let's think about, again, as we try to draw the lessons out, is what were the incentives that led them to do this? Well, they did something very, very innovative in a way, which is that they said, well, look, we want to try and consolidate all of our care within that 30 days, and they called that a bundle. A bundle is conceptually very simple. Any of us who have shopped for an automobile understand that. You buy a car, you get a 10-year, 100,000-mile warranty. If your car breaks down in that period of time, the dealer has to cover it. It's the same thing in healthcare. A bundle is essentially warranty pricing. You get a fixed bundle of services for a period of time, and as a result, your doctors, the healthcare system, are incentivized to do everything they can. And you heard not only about the bundle, but you heard about how it catalyzed change from Dr. Allen. What did they actually do when you really think about it? Again, this is not rocket science. They created an algorithm that automatically popped up a, a, um, a warning that you had a patient that was in the hospital. They had standardized order sets that also popped up. These were small nudges that helped doctors and the system do the right thing. And it all got started because of this concept of this bundle. But where did this bundle actually come from? How did it actually happen? I think here again are lessons, not only for Colorado, but for the healthcare system as a whole, and for others who are thinking about getting involved in this kind of care and these types of little experiments. They had a very clear goal, and this is one of the drivers of what, how change actually occurred, and how you can see it filtering out from what's happening here in Washington across the country. As we saw, one of the things that Medicare did was to start a program where if your patients were readmitted within uh, a certain period of time, 30 days, at rates that were too high, your hospital would get fined. The potential fine that a hospital is exposed to could be millions of dollars. As a result, 
everybody across the country started to think about, well, how can we stop people from coming back to the hospital? And as you heard, a major component of that are patients with congestive heart failure. This was the spark that then was fanned into a flame by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, as you heard by, from uh, Dr. Pham. And they said, look, we want to help you. We're going to help you create these bundles of care. We're going to let you experiment. And so that's how the natural innovative spirit of Colorado was unleashed. And so I think that's one of the first lessons, is that we first need to find people who can catalyze change. They are out there. They want to make a difference if they can be incentivized. But not only are they out there, it's very interesting how they actually got the idea. As you heard from Dr. Allen, it wasn't he that went to the federal government and said, look, I have this idea. Can you pass a law and have Medicare and Medicaid think about these new innovative payment models? No, those models had been created already. And CMMI then had conveners. They had these individuals that are essentially like apostles who go out there and teach you what to do. So you had this unique connection of the conveners who go out to find people who want to innovate. They tell them how on earth you sort of create these complex financial models, how do you get it together, and they connect with local innovators like Dr. Allen and Elizabeth Kissick, the administrator there, who actually helped them get this together. This type of fundamental sort of spreading of knowledge is the same way Johnny Appleseed works, right? We get that information out there. They spread innovation. They nurture innovation. This is exactly how the we became such a self-sustaining economy with farmers. Far farming is equally complex, and yet through the federal government, we had a system of having people who go out there and teach you all the principles of basic agriculture. And as a result, through the Green Revolution, we now feed billions of people. The same thing can happen in healthcare, and that role of the convener is one of the critical things that I think we can take away from this experience. And the second was something Dr. Allen also referred to. What was the upside? The actual upside, although it doesn't project well here, was that the total amount they chose to gain in a year, if everything went well, was $30,000 to $40,000. It wasn't millions of dollars that it took to make this kind of change. It was simply creating a small impulse that let them do the right thing. So this, the other key lesson I think that we can take away is that this can be done without having massive financial incentives. Yes, it, at least you're starting to light the fire in these areas. And it's sort of surprising when you think about it. And this then leads to the third lesson, which is that change works best when you don't have to think about it. Think about, again, the interventions that were put into place. Did they require a doctor or a caregiver to walk to a different area of the hospital, spend a lot of time playing with a computer, and then come back? No, they were built into the regular workflow of the physicians, the nurse practitioners, and others that were in the hospital. And this type of seamless type of uh, changes in care, whether you would call them nudges or any other type of sort of change that happens when you're not thinking about it, are another key lesson to take away here. That's how you make change. However, there were also some lessons that I think we can all take away about what else we can do with this experience. And I'm sure Dr. Allen will be the first to admit. What are the limitations and challenges? Well, the first is pretty basic, right? Who are we really targeting? It's people that are already in the hospital. These are people that are already sick. Are we even thinking about prevention? Not yet. Are we integrating primary care providers in any substantial way into the system to make sure that the patients never get admitted in the first place? Again, the payment incentives are not there. And I don't mean this as an indictment, but again, to realize that this is a small piece of a much broader ecology of care that we're delivering. The second thing to keep in mind is, is this scalable? And with all due respect, recall, you, to create this bundle, you had a federal bureaucracy involved. They hired a convener. They found an administrator who spent hours poring over extremely complex spreadsheets to actually calculate what a bundle should look like. And you had innovators that devoted a huge amount of time. And do you know what the number of patients they hope to serve through this bundle was in a year, according to their models? 100 patients. Think about that's the thousands and millions of patients throughout the country that have equally complex chronic medical diseases. 
Can we devote those kinds of resources to come with bundles for every single one of them? Difficult to say. Perhaps it could be done through some partial bundling system or something else along those lines. But this is one of the key criticisms that's made of this concept. Is this scalable? Again, as we'll see, there is no one size solution that fits all. This is an excellent place to start targeting that one area, which is complex hospitalization and bundled payments. Through Duke University, let's return to this ecology of care again. Extremely complex, lots of people involved. As you may have been able to tell, they chose a very different strategy. Duke chose not to enroll in the bundle payment pilot, but as Dr. Pham pointed out, there were two other interesting models of payment. The first is something called a medical home, where per patient, a facility or group of caregivers get a fee. The other is something called the accountable care organization, or shared savings, which is essentially, as Duke uh, would point out, essentially a set budget. Now, it's complicated. It's not really, you know, you don't get that money right up front. But the basic concept is fairly straightforward, which is that on a per patient basis, with some risk adjustment, you own that patient. Meaning, not only do you own that patient's funding, but you also then own all the medical care they're responsible for. As a result, you are focused not just on that 30-day hospitalization, but on a broader spectrum of care. Do they go to the hospital in the first place? Do they go to the emergency room or not? Because if your institution is able to prevent that, then they keep part of the difference. They're fundamentally incentivized through, a, through this payment strategy to do more than just look at that 30-day hospitalization. What this allows them to do then is innovate more broadly. They can then focus on prevention. And as you heard from Dr. Epen, that's one of the reasons why they've chosen this particular payment reform, because they feel their innovative strategy goes along with that. Through the same day access clinic, if a patient calls up and says, you know, I'm kind of short of breath. I think I might need to go to the emergency room. Dr. Epen would say, no, no, no. We have this other service. Come in. We'll put an IV in your arm, give you a medicine. You'll get rid of that fluid, and maybe you can go home. That avoided and a visit to the emergency room. It avoided thousands of dollars in medical costs. And Duke University, as a result, might get a little bit of that, bit of that savings. And the other person to get the savings is all of us, because Medicare saves as well. Again, fundamentally aligning those incentives. This is complex stuff, but at least as they would tell you the concept here is the right care, meaning you get the right medicines. You get IV diuretics instead of just getting a phone call and exhortations to eat better when you need it. Not only that, you get in the right place. If you can get an IV in an in a outpatient facility, why don't you just do it there? Why do you have to go to the emergency room? So it's the right care at the right place. And the third thing, as you heard, is it's also at the right time. You don't wait till they're sick. You don't wait till they're so short of breath that they need a hospitalization. You do it before they ever need to get to the hospital in the first place. And again, on some fundamental level, having this concept of accountable care, this longitudinal way of paying for care where you own the totality of care, then creates fundamental incentives for an institution then to do what they haven't done before, which is to then think about how do we integrate hospital care with outpatient care and primary care, and not only that, non-cardiac care. Because as you also heard from the team, it's rare that you only have heart failure. People have depression. They have anxiety. They have all kinds of other issues. They have diabetes. And all those types of care need to be integrated into that care. Just this week, there was an excellent example uh, that was published in JAMA Internal Medicine that if you just do telephone-based follow-up for anxiety or other psychological disorders in patients who have congestive heart failure, they do markedly better after they leave the hospital. So in some fundamental way, the Duke system may incentivize those types of explorations. But again, there were limitations and challenges. I think one of the key ones is that I think it's fascinating when you look at the, you heard about these innovative examples, right? Uh, one emergency room had a booklet with physician photos in it. I can tell you, I work in an emergency room, we don't have anything like that. In fact, I don't even know how I would have heard about that unless I'd been at the conference today. 
you heard from Dr. Allen about how they've created an innovative algorithm that was from Texas to help predict who's in the hospital. My hospital doesn't have that either. As a result, one of the key things I would like to point out is that this innovative payment strategy model that we've done, doing lots of little experiments, makes a lot of sense. However, people are still working largely in isolation. They are reinventing the wheel in multiple places across the country, and we have to make that better in some way. The second, and I'd like to point this out, is that even though we like to talk about these payment reforms as being terrific and they sort of align the incentives, the truth is, is that they all still fill out the same paperwork. This is still what's called the fee-for-service system that's built on, a, on this other kind of accounting system. As a result, you still need the same number of people who process bills and secretaries and billers and all that stuff. That really has not been cut substantially. And we have not figured out, in addition to that, how a place like Duke, with billions of dollars of care flowing in, sure, we'll cap, your, we'll cap the amount of money we're giving them, but how exactly do we divvy that up to make sure everybody does the right thing? I can tell you that Dr. Epen is probably not taking billions of dollars home right now. But on a more fundamental level, how do we make sure that those line up, particularly large institutions? And we haven't really figured out how to do that. And there are innovative ideas around that as well. And so we all have a very, very long way to go. I'd like to say that today's meeting here dramatizes a much more detailed case study that will be available online uh, through our program uh, shortly. You can read the specific details about it and specifically about what Duke and Colorado did if you'd like to learn more details. But I want to stop there and tell you a little story that supports and hopefully gives a sense of optimism as we talk about clinician engagement in payment reform and delivery system reform. Between 1968 and today, deaths from heart problems have fallen about 50% across the country. In fact, across the world. And when you think about how exactly did that happen, I wrote about this last year in The Lancet, uh, using work that others have done. The fascinating thing is there wasn't a single fancy medicine that could be responsible. It's not like innovators discovered a new heart drug, a new stent, a new device. Fascinatingly, how did this happen? It was a combination of multiple small things. Reduced smoking, better heart surgery, to be sure, better exercise and diet, and better long-term blood pressure uh, control, among many, many other things. What this demonstrates is that the problems that we're talking about, those of chronic disease, are ones that are going to require small steps. It's scooping a tunnel through a mountain using a spoon. But we've done it before. And this is how we've gotten there, is having multiple small interventions that are all supported. These are not dramatic. And this is one of the fundamental questions of how we should address this. This is not a little pill you can give to somebody with cancer and they're miraculously better. Those types of innovations spread on their own because their benefit is so self-evident. Rather, the types of innovations we've talked about today, payment reform, long-term chronic care, outpatient medical care, they don't excite the same enthusiasm. And so we need a different model to spread those. We've done it before in cardiology. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Yes, we can make heart care better. How are we actually going to get there? Well, I like to think that the innovations that we've talked about today can be put into that same category of those pills that help people. A call from a nurse practitioner to say, how are you feeling a day or two after you're hospitalized? To say that, yes, we have an appointment for you. If we have, somebody who can talk to the pharmacist says, did you actually refill those medications on time? Somebody who actually, call, uh, when you get admitted to the hospital, something that pops up to say, doctor, there's a patient with congestive heart failure who's coming to the hospital. Those are equally exciting innovations. Those are equally responsible. And these types of payment reforms might be able to drive that forward. Two of the most boring words in healthcare policy today are continuous improvement. We like to think about boldness, innovation, new changes, new technology. And yet, 
I would argue continuous improvement is responsible for most of the progress we see today. It's important to point out that healthcare challenges can fall into one of two categories. The first are technical problems. This is where we simply don't have the knowledge. We don't have the special pill that fixes things. The other category is problems of execution. We already know the right thing to do. We're just not doing it. And much of the care of congestive heart failure can be put into that category. I like to sort of tell an additional story to drive that point home. In 1970, if you had a child with leukemia, that child had a 90% chance of dying. Nine out of 10 kids with leukemia died not so long ago, around the time I was a kid. Today, only 10% of children with leukemia die. 90% of them walk away. And not only do they walk away from the disease, they live perfectly healthy, long-term lives in many cases. How did that happen? Was it a new miraculous chemotherapeutic agent? New bone marrow transplants? No. In fact, the major reduction in leukemia deaths involved no new medication at all. We used the same ones. What's different? We learned how to use them right. Through painstaking studies over years, we learned the proper doses, routes of administration, ways of managing toxicity over all that period in time. And as a result, every year we got 1% or 2% better. And after about 40 years or so, that added up. And that's what led to this marked and very impressive improvement. Again, those little steps there were people out there. It was not the fierce urgency of now, but the gradual drumbeat of slow progress. And again, those are the types of innovations in congestive heart failure our payment reform has to drive. How do we get there? Changing people falls into three categories. The first is we can ask people to change. Please do the right thing. Take this online course. We know that that can work in some cases, but in general, that's not a real strategy for getting systems change. The second is the law and order approach. You have to do this. You're going to face huge penalties. And as we saw with the 30-day readmission penalty, that can also drive in the right direction. It's a part of the step that happens. The third is outright bribery, which is sort of what we do with pay for performance in other areas. We try to incentivize care, either through nudges or through financial inducements. The problem with that is that as you saw with that ecology of care, it is unbelievably complicated to get all those incentives right. When you have 50 people that are all being motivated in different ways, that means you have to create 50 different incentive strategies for each of them. That can be done, but I'd submit in closing that none of this gets to what we all really, really want in the healthcare system, which is what we saw a little bit of today that's already at Colorado and Duke and arguably at hundreds of centers across the country, which is we want to create a culture of change, this virtual cycle of innovation. How do we actually get there? Because none of these pay for performance or other billing schemes are going to make any difference when people are just punching buttons to get their rewards. Just this week, we have a result from, the ARC, uh, from JAMA Internal Medicine that shows that our whole effort at getting electronic medical records has many, many positive things. But it turns out people who click the buttons and get their meaningful use benefits, in some cases, have worse outcomes than people that don't do it. Why is that happening? It's because we haven't created the actual desire and culture of change. We've just created the incentives that people jump through. Arguably, none of us want to get there. So we tried the three ways of getting there by asking people, forcing people, and bribing people. But I would argue, finally, that the way to really get to the cultural change is sort of what we're doing today, which is that people need to tell their stories. This is how any major change has always been distributed. It is by people sharing their experience, by finding other like-minded clinicians, and having those discussions, clinician to clinician, hospital leader to hospital leader, patient to patient, and person to person. And hopefully through this series of events that we started to convene, we're going to try to start sharing that experience through these cases we put out there, at least start as another spark in this way to make our healthcare system better. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Darshak. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the, a senior fellow here. I'm the director of the uh, initiative on healthcare innovation and value, of which our Merkin initiative on, on uh, 
payment reform and clinician leadership is a part. And I'm uh, very glad to be following Dr. Sangavi and his leadership on taking us through the real world of healthcare reform. And we've done that in the context of heart failure, uh, broken hearts. This is, as you've heard, a very common condition in the United States, one that accounts for a lot of uh, deaths and one that is very scary for patients. It's not only the higher risk of death, but the feeling that you can't even breathe uh, when you're suffering from this condition. And thanks to all of our speakers here today, we've heard about ways in which care can be improved for these patients. And uh, just looking at uh, Judge uh, Satterfield, it's uh, really impressive to see what a difference effective medical care can make, uh, not only in the lives of individuals, but in the lives of so many people that they touch. This is why what we're doing here in terms of real health care reform matters so much. It's about better, longer lives. It's also about avoiding those unnecessary costs, but it's really about a tremendous impact on the lives of millions of patients and all of the people that they touch. Now, we've heard today about a lot of ways in which care for people with heart failure can be improved. Now, this is, a, again, a focused area in all of healthcare, but one that has a lot of lessons more broadly. It includes approaches like promoting better coordination of care. A primary care physician can't do it alone, a cardiologist can't do it alone, and they can often work effectively with pharmacists, nurse practitioners, other members of a care team. That means support for coordination. We've heard about new ways of helping take care to where patients are, uh, not in the hospital when they have complications, but at home using wireless technologies and remote monitoring, using ways of staying in touch with patients before and after they get care from their traditional healthcare provider settings. And we've heard about new technologies and new research on using technologies effectively, devices, drugs, other interventions that can make a big difference in the lives of patients. But if you've if also heard today, this not only doesn't always happen, it often does not happen. With 70% of the hospitalizations for heart failure, one of the most common reasons for hospitalizations among older Americans and really among the entire US population being due to exacerbations of this condition where what people get when they go into the hospital is their fluids rebalances, some, rebalance some support uh, to help their hearts work a bit better conditions that, complications that probably could be prevented in the first place using all of those innovative approaches to care that you've heard about. Now, we've heard too from clinicians today who are leading the way on making that a reality or making those kinds of continuous improvements in care to change, to truly reform the way that care is delivered for patients with heart failure in this country. And you've heard that that is not easy. Uh, it takes uh, a lot of changes. It might take changes in culture. It certainly might take changes in practices among healthcare providers and the structure uh, of organizations. And that too is scary. So this is not just scary for patients. It can be scary for clinicians involved in their care. Are these reforms really going to succeed? Can we afford to do it given the budgets of our institutions or our office practices? It's really hard. But what we've heard about today is a path forward in doing this. Now, many organizations, including if you read about Duke and Colorado in the case studies today, many of these organizations have tried to make these reforms taking their payment systems as given, because these systems are hard to change. It's frustrating. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of government activity involved, a lot of private payers. It can all be very frustrating. And many of them have tried to do it within their current financing constraints. They try to get grants. Uh, they try to pull in extra resources from somewhere in order to do what patients need most. That's really hard. And that's why we are focusing so much in our efforts here on linking these goals of real reforms in care with approaches to make it easier to pull off. Alignment between payment or financing, alignment between payment or financing and the actual delivery of care. And you've heard today, and Darshak uh, just summarized some ways in which that can go forward effectively. Uh, the themes that I, that I picked up included identifying some specific ways to reform care, 
not trying to boil the ocean, but identifying where there are some real clinical gaps in care and ways that those can be addressed in your organization, whether it's a small practice or a large academic medical center. There is now an increasing amount of uh, database and other resource tools available to help support these efforts. Uh, second, you need data, you need measures. Uh, once again, data systems are getting better. They certainly have big gaps, but things like identifying preventable readmissions and getting those admission rates down is a great way to focus concretely on some of the steps, uh, on the impact of some of the steps to improve care. Uh, and then that's where payment reforms come in. Now it might be nice if we lived in a world with unlimited resources and there would be additional payments available for every single thing that we want to try. But you all who are in medicine uh, and you all who are looking at federal budget deficits know that that is not the reality. Uh, if anything, uh, payments are going to get worse for health care providers. With the squeezes that are happening at the federal government and the state level, uh, all we've seen steadily over time, one of the final common pathways of health care reform, when we can't do it better, is provider payment rates get cut back, get squeezed down. And that's why more and more healthcare organizations are now turning to other ways, changing the way that they get paid to create that alignment between what they want to do for their patients, what can make the most difference, and the way that they get resources in. And you've heard about some different models for doing that today. The idea of bundled payments for a piece uh, of all of the care being provided. Uh, uh, patients who are admitted with heart failure maybe for 30 days after. Uh, a single payment that allows more flexibility in supporting things like steps to coordinate care and prevent uh, readmissions and intervene with patients uh, uh, after they leave the hospital so they don't come back in, so they can uh, live better. We've heard about some limitations of that approach. It's a new kind of financial risk. It's only a piece uh, of overall care, even for patients with heart failure, and it creates uh, some financial uncertainty as well. Duke has moved towards a system that uses shared savings, an accountable care organization, the idea of transitioning from fee-for-service payments to payments that are based on the overall costs and some overall measures of quality of care for a patient population, their overall outcomes. That's their path to alignment. Many smaller physician groups may not see themselves in that whole broad accountable care organization approach, although here at Brookings we're working with a number of small physician practices, even just primary care practices, who are actually starting to take on uh, that big focus on overall care and overall efficiency for their patients. But there are other ways forward too. Dr. Pham talked about the uh, medical home or advanced primary care initiatives at CMS. What that does is take some of the payments that had been fee-for-service and convert them to a case or a person-based payment that gives the physicians and other clinicians involved more flexibility in how they provide resources and support for those patients. Now we've seen that tried most with primary care practices, but we're seeing it more often with specialty practices where that same focus on what the patient needs in terms of coordinating care with primary care physicians, in terms of tailoring services to individual patients can make a difference. In all of these areas, we're seeing more and more experience with how to make these systems work. As you've heard, none of this is easy. It's very frustrating, but the alternative is worse. The alternative is worse from the standpoint of healthcare financing, of more and more dollars going to treat more and more preventable complications, something that is not sustainable from a fiscal standpoint. But more importantly, it's worse from the standpoint of patient care. There are so many more personalized, more prevention-oriented, more effective approaches to using care methods that are not part of traditional medicine that can lead to better results as well as lower costs for patients. And that's the real reason to continue these efforts. It is a long journey as many of the physicians and other healthcare providers that we work with say this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, but we are seeing more examples of successful steps, adjustments in course that can be made when challenges arise to keep moving down this road of real health care reform. Now we've got a few minutes left uh, today before we wrap up uh, for questions and comments from those 
those of you who are here with us and for those of you who have joined us online, we'd encourage you to send in uh, your comments via the, the Twitter feed for our Med Talk today. Uh, so I'd like to get, uh, uh, we're going to take a break, I guess, for a second to get the chairs up on stage and I'd like for you all to think about comments and questions uh, uh, in that time. We're going to have, uh, you can go ahead and bring them on up. Uh, we're going to have our uh, speakers who are still with us uh, join us up on stage for this uh, final discussion, uh, Judge Satterfield, Dr. Proc, Dr. Apen, uh, Dr. Cheeley, Dr. Allen, and Dr. Sangavi. So uh, uh, we'll get that situated right now, and thanks again for joining us. All right, we've got a couple of mics uh, uh, that are going to go around among, uh, among the group. Uh, let me start with uh, any questions from the audience, and please just tell us who you are when you ask your question or make your comment. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Richard Katz from uh, GW uh, and uh, Director of, of Cardiology. Uh, and one uh, another thing is you gotta like uh, line yourself up with the microphone. For I that think I've allotted myself well. everything. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it it uh, a uh, a new era, and I agree with really uh, uh, our our speakers here today. And we've been seeing this and change, and working at actually a couple years uh, already at GW, uh, even without any payment uh, issues. Let me go back to the Duke patient. The Duke patient was living outside of town with a someone who knew about chronic care management. And yet, it took till he got really sick until he came to that clinic. There's something wrong with that. And that, the, and that, the, the, uh, that someone is not in the community or someone who has a professional expertise isn't knowing what to look for. And then the patient comes gets a shot of IV di 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 diuretics, and I'm sure there's much more that Duke can tell us about. But then you switch to Dr. Allen and, and, the, and the Columbia, where, and, uh, and uh, to uh, Colorado, where there are a lot of elements that need to be put in place to prevent that person even coming to the same-day diuretic clinic. So for example, what we've done aligned with Grand Aids, which uh, you know about, we're from uh, uh, Tim Garson down in, in Charlottesville, uh, we have in a training community health worker. And just as one of many different parts of the, uh, of the system who are like our patients who uh, are gonna be out in the community who are aligned with us. There's, and if a person comes into the emergency room, the emergency room doc before they admit them has to call our care coordinating nurse to see if we can do that because if I ask you in Colorado, what percentage of the patients who come to the emergency room who need, really need to be admitted, it would be obviously less than 50%. So these kind of changes of really getting to the basics of what's on, but the community health workers aren't paid for, that's $35,000 per year salary. The nurse practitioner who I have sitting next to me who runs our heart failure program, there's no reimbursement for, for, for the hundreds of, of calls that she makes uh, all along. So this change of the, the payment and how we package it as well as putting in these very granular kind of pieces right. is critical. So Dr. Allen, Dr. Chile clearly made some important steps in reforming heart failure care, but as you've heard, there maybe is more to do to get to early prevention and even more community-focused approaches using grand aids or other uh, community workers or uh, home health support. Maybe start with you all on how you can move in that direction, especially if you don't have payments that are aligned to support it. Yeah, so I, I appreciate your very pointed comments. And, you know, I think, I, I, I think back to some of the remarks that uh, both Larry and Darshak made about uh, process of, I don't know, continuous improvement or, or virtuous improvement or virtuous innovation. And uh, I think that many institutions around the country are at different points in their own process of coming to terms with what payment reform is going to mean for taking care of patients. And many of us, starting at different points, are working in different places, and we have different gaps to fill. And one of the things that I really have enjoyed today has been the opportunity to idea share. And I think that having the chance to hear how you all have approached some of those changes is particularly helpful for us as we are uh, only live in, in our shared savings program since January of this year, and we're really still learning what that will mean for our organization. So uh, I'm not sure that I, that I have a uh, 
direct answer per se, other than forums like these to help us learn from each other how we can begin to change faster are, are really invaluable. Yeah, and as I mentioned, I, I mean, the University of Colorado really is primarily an acute care institution. And the, the, uh, the interventions that you talked about, as well as how you would have to innovate healthcare to really deal with prevention and talk about populational health, really require, to some extent, a, a significant rethinking and destructuring of the way that healthcare is currently set up in Denver and around the country. So, um, but everything has advantages and disadvantages. I mean, there's obviously problems with capitation and, and populational health that have to be challenged as well to make sure that people don't get a fixed payment and then don't take care of patients. So we really have to have a blending of this populational health, thinking about things longitudinally, but also incentivizing people to do the right thing along the way. Uh, any other comments from the panel? Dr. Pham, do you want to talk about uh, further steps that you all are taking in this direction? Well, I think one of the other themes that pops out at me from your comment is um, the, really the centrality of team-based care. I mean, we, we're all, many of us are physicians up here, and uh, as we know our kind, we tend to be physician-centric. But the reality is that physicians alone cannot get this work done. And uh, at the Innovation Center, we, we recognize that and we really are very invested in um, exploring the multitude of ways that team-based care can be used creatively. So last year, for example, we funded over almost a billion dollars worth of what we refer to as the Healthcare Innovation Awards, grants for individual communities and organizations to work together precisely on strategies like reliance on community health workers or uh, alliances between ambulance companies and you know, rural health clinics, et cetera. Um, and, and I think it also goes to another theme that I heard from many of the presenters, which is that healthcare is very local. And you know, we, what we want to do is to not dictate how you should do it. We, we want to signal what we think the important outcomes are and trust that if you are in it for the right reasons, you're going to take stock of your local conditions and what your local patient's preferences are, how your providers tend to work or prefer to work, and go with that. Um, and that's the kind of creativity we'd like to unleash. A uh, question back here. follows up, oh, there we go, God. <laughs> blessings of microphones. Um, it follows up from the question, I believe, from Dr. Katz. We know that, as you mentioned, these are often individuals with comorbid complex care needs for whom long-term services and supports, or LTSS services, as we often label them, um, are desperately needed. Things like medication management assistance, um, falls prevention, um, direct home care workers, transportation, uh, the myriad of things, particularly for low-income seniors, as we focus on in um, congregate settings such as affordable housing. And yet when we have tried to work with managed care and ACOs, if there even is an awareness for integrating long-term services and supports, it is only at the cheapest vendor who they can buy with the lowest dollar, which has very little to do with the kinds of idealized population-based healthy communities or innovative communities as a long-term quality alliance that's housed here in Brookings would refer us to. And so I think part of our challenge is how do we also, not as this only is this very hospital-centric, but the payments are still very hospital physician-centric, and yet the solutions are so much bigger. How are there incentives beyond just shared savings? Because he who holds the bundle will write the checks, and right now, the bundlers tend to look at the cheapest purchases 
they can find in the community and hang on to the margin. So how do we drive to an enhanced focus? And maybe there isn't a simple solution, but um, gosh, if you guys can't come up with it, I don't know who can. Right, so if you missed the first part of the question online, it was that well, there, there has been some progress in moving away from financial incentives that discourage keeping people out of the hospital and preventing complications, uh, boy, there still is a, a, a long way to go to really achieve that goal of uh, optimal care. Um, uh, Dr. Pham? Well, I, first of all, I, I would say that I completely acknowledge your observation, and I think that uh, those patients, those particularly vulnerable patients, keep many of us awake at night. Um, that said, I, I think it's too early to be discouraged or to come to ready conclusions about what ACOs or other providers in accountable care systems will try to do. We're very early on in our learning. Right now, they're just trying to get out of the red in terms of their early investments and figure out how to do some basic clinical work better. Um, I think that as, as time goes on and providers become more experienced and confident, but also the payers, um, we will venture into some of those much more difficult circumstances and think about them. So the Innovation Center um, has, you know, through our strategic refresh, really taken a, a fresh look at our investment in Medicaid and dually eligible populations and what to do for them. Um, and I think that in the coming weeks and months, you will see more evidence of that. But I, I agree that we can't hide from those issues. They may be in the, you know, Maslow hierarchy of needs. They may be just one step away um, because it is that much more difficult. Now let me ask, so this actually relates to a question that we've gotten from Twitter, and uh, uh, Mai, I'm gonna skip you for this one. Uh, I think you've already given some of the answer, but uh, for some of the others on the panel, what is the most important thing the federal government could do to support responsible payment reform? Big question, but an important one. Uh, sure. <laughs> I mean, there, there's, there's, men, there's no shortage of ideas about things the federal government could do. Um, uh, I think my personal opinion, uh, and this is no way the, um, the, the only answer, is that um, I think one other way we can experiment is to make um, transparency of pricing and quality uh, radically uh, more apparent to the end user. So I, I would support the ability for patients um, and caregivers in some way to easily evaluate how much things cost. So this would mean allowing much wider access to a federal payer and quality data than we currently allow. Um, as at least one way to get started. And the second thing I'd want is I believe private payers should do the same thing. Thanks, and uh, Judge Satterfield, I don't wanna put you on the spot with, uh, uh, with becoming a healthcare expert, and you're certainly not a typical patient, but uh, in, in hearing all this, do, what, what do you think is, is missing, or where is, is there a disconnect? Does it seem like it's really getting at the, uh, the problems of the healthcare system as you see it? And actually, I guess you see it not just as a patient, but uh, in your in your day-to-day -day work, too, some of the consequences of uh, health care problems. Well, two observations I'll, I'll make. One is the last question was the federal government can do to help. It really is to listen to the people who have the innovative ideas, some coming out of this room and so forth, because, uh, you know, in my field, we know folks don't listen to us. We, we tend to think of uh, hospitals as a jail. We tend to put people in jail that don't need to be in jail. Sure, they're your violent offenders. I've put a fair share of those in jail. But most of the people are people with drug addiction, plenty of mental, Ill, mental health uh, illnesses, uh, conditions uh, populate our jail. So good luck in getting the federal government to listen. We try to get them to listen and stop putting so much money in that industry called prison and put it more in, in the things that will help. Uh, the individuals not go to jail if you treat the, the problem. And the second observation is just, again, change is difficult for people. I agree with that. And, and anytime you try to make a, a massive change that's going to really impact people positively, that's when you get your most resistance, and that's when you really have to stay the course. Great. Uh, thanks very much for the comments. Uh, Dr. Preck, Dr. Apen, uh, uh, anything to add to this? 
Um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity. I think the, the one thing I would reemphasize is the importance of this discussion uh, is, I forget who said this, but follow the money is, is truly a, uh, an accurate observation in this case. And much like you pointed out years ago, we, these solutions are not new. We knew years ago that if you had a, a outpatient clinic or a community-based mechanism to help our patients, they would not end up in the hospital. It just made more financial sense to let them come to the hospital. And this is in part why we're here today. And so to find ways to drive community-based population health um, models and to find ways to pay for them and to make those payment uh, reforms is tremendously important, even though it's not exactly sexy. The only other thing I would add is that uh, I think what people said earlier is exactly right. This is not a problem that we can only cut our way out of. This is going to require some growth in new directions, and it's really going to require stimulating innovation in terms of uh, how we might be able to change care delivery. And I'll give you one example. Uh, we talked with paramedics in Durham County about uh, what challenges they face in terms of sending patients to the hospital. One of the first issues they said is, well, that's what we get paid for. You know, we can only get paid if we send somebody to the emergency department with a few exceptions. And so for them to be stakeholders in this, just as the community health workers might be for grand days, mm -hmm. just as other people might be outside of the hospital, we need to think about how payment reform can be more inclusive and help drive those different care delivery models so that people are not paid for just transporting somebody to the emergency department. We're not paid just for fee for services uh, delivered in the hospital. So the payment reform needs to be able to uh, be tailored to new and innovative strategies and to encourage that innovation. All right, well, I want to thank you all for the comments, and uh, Judge, glad to hear that healthcare is not the only uh, industry where, uh, where change is hard. Um, I have one last question from uh, Twitter before we break today, which is how much of what we've talked about today in the context of heart failure is applicable to other chronic diseases and elsewhere in our healthcare system? Any final thoughts on that as we wrap up? I'll start and then maybe Larry can finish up. I, I think it's uh, tremendously applicable in many ways. So um, I ran a heart failure, I run, recently ran a heart failure program at um, Hopkins and we took ideas from all over uh, the country and the world um, to set up our program. I took ideas from the sickle cell uh, program to set up a clinic not like, unlike the one at Duke, uh, a program in Scotland that had volunteers instead of community health workers because we couldn't afford to pay community health workers. So we set up a volunteer program. So I think there, much as we learned from all over the world and, and other diseases to come up with programs, I think Larry's uh, no different because I actually spoke to him as well when I set up the program. Um, the world can learn from us. And, and so the successes that we've had in heart failure from identifying patients to outpatient clinics are applicable to um, oncology, to any other major chronic disease really. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I talk about this topic a lot and one of the main messages I give is that Heart failure is just an example of, of chronic disease and what we're really dealing with in medicine. And it's not only because it's a disease that's not easily curable and often gets worse. It's not only because it, it typifies diseases that are chronic and undulating and result in hospitalization, get better, get worse. Um, but it's also because heart failure is caused by other diseases that are also chronic, like hypertension, like diabetes. Um, but then when you look at the consequences of heart failure, there are also chronic diseases that aren't heart failure. So people come back after they've had heart failure with kidney disease um, and, and, other, and depression and other problems that are interrelated. So, you know, that, that's the, one of the key messages I would take home from this is that healthcare reform and healthcare innovation, one of the biggest changes about it is it's got to go from focusing on the hospital and the providers to focusing on the patient. And I think if the money focuses on taking care of the patient and the ideas and the care focus on the patient, this concept of thinking about what's right, what's best, what is most efficient, actually then everything starts to align. So, you know, should we be offering clinics for patients to, um, you know, to help them early on in the disease? Should we be doing prevention? Um, should we be having community health workers engaged? All these things, if you think about it from the patient perspective, I think it starts to get a little easier to, to think about the specifics of how you redesign both the payment as well as the care delivery uh, to make more sense for all of us. 
Uh, as a hospitalist, I have the chance to take care of patients with heart failure, to take care of patients with COPD, to take care of patients with diabetes, all of whom uh, have had exacerbations of, of their chronic conditions. Um, in my role as a medical director for care redesign, uh, one of the great pleasures that I find in helping to convene provider teams and clinical teams and to give them information that they've never had before, to, to Darshak's point about the need for transparency, uh, it's empowering for people to have the tools to be able to think outside the box and to have the support from the institution to be able to think outside the box. And so what for us has been a focus on some specific disease conditions has really transformed into developing a toolkit and an approach that can be applied very, very broadly. And so my comment at the end of my, my, my talk was really directed around uh, giving the people, uh, patients, physicians, nurses, everyone part of that care team the information that they need to be able to design the care appropriately first and to think about the mechanism of payment that will support the changes that an organization needs to make. I think it has really been powerful for, for Duke's experience. Thank you very much, Dr. Sangavi. Any final, uh, final thought or comment? Oh, I, I think I would just uh, end by saying that, um, that uh, at today's event, we see this at the be as the beginning of a conversation. Um, and we hope that, uh, that both people who have come here in person as well as those who have watched this online can continue these discussions uh, in relation to wherever they may be. And perhaps if they learn anything, share those lessons with us here as well. Thank you. Uh, the, the stories we've heard today matter from the patient standpoint, from the standpoint of a range of clinicians who are trying to change care, and we very much value all, your participation as well, both here in the room uh, and online. As Dr. Sangavi said, uh, there will be more activity like this as part of our Merkin Initiative on payment reform and clinical leadership, and we look forward to uh, continuing this very, very difficult but very important journey together uh, on, health, on real health care reform. Thank you all very much. Thank you.